for me. I know the Lord will fix it for me. This is Freetown. About all that's left is a chimney. An old fallen down house. A clearing in the woods where a house once stood. But to some people who grew up here, this tiny black community near the village of Lahore in Orange County, Virginia, is a special place. A place that lives on in their memories and in the legends and stories passed down by their forebears. People like Lou Stanley Lewis, who was born here in Freetown. People that, that lived over in here seems to have been blessed. As I said, it was church people, and um, they always sang and had a good time. They were all hard workers. Of course, everybody that came along in any place, I think, was hard workers then because people, people didn't have much. Or people like Annie Tolls, who lived there for years. It was a wonderful place, that's all I can say. And I love Freetown. I still love it. I go there every chance I get. Or C. Quarles, another native of Freetown. Life was good. We enjoyed it. Running around, playing as kids, Lou Stanley, myself, and a few others lived there in Freetown. Or George Terrell, who did not live in Freetown, but who walked 12 miles a day to attend school there in the late 1880s and early 1890s. It may have been there, how sweet it sounds. See a rest like thee. I worked with laws, but now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. Or Edna Lewis, who ran as a barefoot child through the dirt streets of Freetown, and who later moved to the bustle of New York to become a successful restaurateur, gourmet cook, and cookbook author. And whatever the neighbors had, you could share with. If someone was ill, fell ill, then the neighbors would go in and milk the cows and feed the chickens and clean the house and cook the food and come at night and sit up with you if someone was sick. It was great. I never met any people like them. All of these people and others have their memories of Freetown and they tell their stories of this remarkable community, making sure the memories won't die. The documented history of Freetown is sketchy. Descendants of the founders believe it was established sometime after the Civil War by freed slaves. Like hundreds of other small black communities scattered throughout the South, it served as a mechanism to cope with the exuberant and sometimes frightening concept of freedom. Dr. Jacqueline Walker of the James Madison University Department of History. The communities that were established following the Civil War, it was definitely in line the black quest for independence, you know, from whites, economically, socially, uh, spiritually. Grandpa Chester Lewis was a slave, owned by the George W. Morton family, who were large landowners in the general area of Freetown. The legend goes that years ago there was a raid on an Indian encampment, and when it was over, slaves went through the ruins and found two abandoned Indian babies who were raised by the slaves as slaves. It is said that one of the Indians was Chester's mother. The Indian features are still apparent today in the faces of the grandchildren of Grandpa Chester. He's just about tall as I am, maybe a little taller. Mm -hmm. Just about built for my height, about slim as I is. He weighed about 180 pounds. I would say I weigh 170, cause, but when I remember him, see, he was an old man then. He used to take me in the woods, get stumps to bring, put on a fire with a sleigh. I remember that. He did farm work, plow, and drive oxen, and mules, things like that. Could be tall. But my grandfather was a very serious person. And probably kind of wise. But this patriarch of Freetown was not without humor. Annie Tolls remembers a conversation that took place on the porch of Jackson's store, just walking distance from Freetown, where farmers of both races often stopped to buy, trade, or just chat. And they saw him on one day. He was sitting on the porch at Lahore. And this white man came up behind him and said, Chess, I heard you was dead. 
He said, yeah, I heard too, but I know it was a lie, regular I heard it. <laughs> Just across the road from Freetown is Ellerslie, a manor house built around 1855 by Robert P. Cave. He purchased a slave, perhaps in Albemarle County, called Lucinda. She was valued in 1861 at $950, being listed as 19 years old at the time. Somehow, she and Chester Lewis met, and they were married. Edna Lewis says Grandma Cindy was a brick mason who helped build the cave manor house. And Aunt Cindy built a monument to herself. <laughs> this is how it was. By the 1870 census, Lucinda and Chester, husband and wife, were living in the general area and had started a family. He was listed as a farmhand, she as living at home. The land on which Freetown was built was part of a 1,300-acre tract owned by a developer of the Piedmont, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad named Claiborne Rice Mason. The home, Cloverdale, was built around 1857. By the time Freetown was getting organized, Claiborne Rice Mason and two of his sons had moved away. But one son remained, Claiborne Rice Jr., and it's believed that one of the founders of Freetown, Robert Punch Ellis, was his coachman. Documents show that by 1870, he and another founder of the community, George Chandler, were living on Mason land, several other families were nearby, and the seed of Freetown had sprouted. This is all that's left of the Chandler home today. Looked upon as something of a benefactor by the residents of Freetown, Claiborne Rice Mason Jr. either sold or gave a small portion of his land to Chandler, making sure, in an 1886 deed, that a subsequent white owner would honor his agreement with the freed slave. Chandler paid for the 14 acres in 1888, subdivided half of it to another Freetown family, the Lindsays, and Freetown was off and running. Names of other key families, such as Quarles, Tolles, Ellis, Lewis, Howard, and Hall, were nearby. They built a log cabin, and he had to cut the logs and, and build it. Later, the log cabin was added onto and sheathed with clapboards. Probably the crowning achievement of this fledgling community was that it established a school and sent away for a teacher. There were no public schools for blacks. Blacks either didn't go to school or they built their own. The first thing they knew that the children had to be educated and that's what they set out to do. Tell me what the school was like. Well, it was in, in this living room and I only know that you know, the first school in the whole area was and conducted in his house. No, no, he didn't know how to read and write as that knows of no. But he had a school right, in his house. He didn't know how to make he had a school in his house. But he did he himself didn't know how to read and write. No, I don't think so. So he must have believed. He did believe. Uh, in education. Oh well, yes, yes, yes. He believed in it. And he, he opened it for the other children to come. He gave that rum to the community. So there's an intense sense of um, a mission of education among, children, among parents to make sure that the children have better than what they had. And they will, they're perfectly willing to sacrifice uh, personal pleasure or, or leisure time or whatever, you know, to make sure that that's available. Individuals, you know, black families would get together and decide that they need to have someone teach the children, they would hire tutors to come and maybe contribute like two pence, uh, two, two pennies a, a month per family or per child and establish, actually establish private schools. And these people are just fresh out of slavery. During the late 1800s and early 1900s, Freetown was in its golden era a self-sufficient, tightly-knit community of 11 families, living pretty much in a circle, with streets radiating out in all directions. I imagine when they first come here, uh, I think then when people first came to a place, they bought the first thing they did out there, probably on the land, they would go and set up fruit trees. There wasn't any market to go anywhere to get any fruit, so they set the trees up. So they didn't have to go to the store to buy much. They have the fruit. So, what about the rest of the food? Well, they had milk cows when I come along. So they made what butter they wanted. They had chicken. I remember when they got ready to kill hog, when my dad got ready to kill hog. Um, like the next neighbor, Robert Toll, next to him, 
they will go down there and build a fire down there. And they, they take wood, cut logs off, put that like that, and and make a little pen with that wood, and put rocks over in there, and then build a fire on that. And when that wood got hot, then rocks got hot. And then you had to have a wooden barrel, and you put these rocks over in the wooden barrel, and they hit the water, and they all just helped each other kill hogs. And I don't think anybody charged anybody anything. Maybe, you know, when you kill the dead, give a piece of meat, and when you kill another man, kill, probably give him some too. Everybody had children when I come along, and I think they did good. Some of them raised six and eight and ten children. Back then, when I was a boy, it was ten of us. But my mother always had a had a plenty um, that she raised in the garden and uh, and down on the little farm. But it didn't take a big farm then. I never remember going hungry, so I can speak for myself. My mother was good. And my dad. Good provider. See, Freetown not a big place. Everybody had a little poison of land. Both six acres, eight acres, ten acres. They worked for the white folks, and the white folks worked good to them, and they more like cropped out sharecropping. And, you know, like a portion of corn, and so much wheat. So they made it. Oh, oh. So how did Freetown get its name anyway? Obviously, it had something to do with freedom and freed slaves. Because everybody in there, there was free. I mean, I, I imagine the parents were slaves. I guess the name has something to do with it, too. You know, because uh, those people in there had were free and had been slaves, and now they were free, and there's a group of free people in the corn phrase free town. But Lou Stanley Lewis says the name actually came from a white man, possibly Philip Jackson, who was the first generation of three to run the country store at Lahore. Oh, how I love Freetown. William Lewis named Freetown. His grandfather named it Freetown. Because the people over here was always, always singing. And he said it was very happy. And he called them free. So they call it free time. That's where it comes from. They tell me that Mr. Jackson's grandfather said everybody's so happy over in this little town. See, we're right behind the little old store here. And he said he was always happy, everybody. And he called it free time. So when I come in, <laughs> knowing what it was, they was happy here. And if I had to say it, I would call it free town. That's where we did all our shopping. It was the general store. And from Freetown, she does a little patch of woods between Freetown and the store. So you didn't have to go out to go on the highway. You just went up the steps and down through the field and the back of the store. And that's where we did it. At that time, he sold everything. Sugar, minced meat for pies, and shoes, and plows, and all the seed for the farmers around. Christmas presents. <laughs> the Valentine's. They were the uh, center where everyone came to, and then everyone would come and sit around and gossip. <laughs> and they, they, they were both, they, Mr. Jackson and his father were both great people. They were really diplomatic. They knew how to not to ever offend anyone and how to get along with people. Freetown also had a defined social order that probably grew from slave times, or even before that, from tribal traditions in Africa. It's a typical African way of living because the early Africans came from a highly organized background. 
when my grandfather died, um, he was laid out in the living room. There was no undertaker at that time. He was just buried up the path. He was buried on his own land. And uh, he was in the house, I guess, for two or three days. And the minute he died, they covered all the mirrors. And that's one of the African groups. Is it has something to do with seeing the spirit, or so they covered the mirrors. The African red, um, influence probably more readily seen in in religious activity, dance, music, um, art, in uh, food. How about social structure? Social structure too. You know that whole concept of extended family which remained because of the fact that uh, really the only persons that um, a slave could be depend on for um, members of his family and his community. And it was also very helpful too because the common threat to a black community was the sale of one or more of its members. And this affected black families in particular. If there was no extended family, no sense that you could depend on others in your community for support and help, and um, then that the breakup of the families would have been a much more severe consequence than um, than it was. You know, and it's common in black communities even today. You know, close neighborhoods. You know, where neighbors you know, have as much influence over your child as, as the parents do. And the usage of of uh, family titles or relational titles to people who are not related who are not actually kin to you, um, again, it's an outgrowth of this extended family outlook. If my neighbors told us something, whatever they told us, my mother accepted it and okayed it, and they could correct you, and you couldn't talk back. <laughs> uh, later on, they would explain to the parents what they said and why, and they were encouraged to do it. And I think in that way, when the children know that you know, people love them and also they know that someone is always there, they, there is less chance of becoming um, unruly or disobedient or whatever. I think it means better children. When you know someone care for you outside of your home, and make you aware of that. When you know everybody like you, you feel bad about yourself. No one wanted to be in disfavor of the whole group. <laughs> and then the, the early Africans had, in the U.S. had their, their own cultural remembrance, you know, how things, how you were supposed to behave. And there was another unwritten social law in Freetown. There was no marriage among the people of Freetown. Everyone in Freetown married someone else from outside. And I heard that happen. With the adult members of the community, even if they're not married or whatever, you know, with that, that taboo extending to them, then um, you don't encounter really hard feelings that broken up intimate relationships you know, would bring to the community. You know, so you kind of safeguard that and you go outside. And the method of solving disputes was handled within the community, though disputes seemed rare and far between. I don't know of any dis uh, misunderstanding between anyone. We helped each other. If, we, if one needed something that we had, we bought it with each other. Uh, I don't know of anything that I could say that was a dispute. That would have to be settled in Freetown. If some people in the church had disagreements, they were called to a meeting, and it was thrashed out. If it wasn't thrashed out this week, they would hold it again and again until it was resolved. And then when it was resolved, they would announce in the church that these two people had resolved their differences, and they would sing, and, and it was over with. <laughs> but they had complete unity, no dissension. Chester Lewis was one of the founding deacons of the Bethel Baptist Church. 
Before 1892, the story goes, the family was a member of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church up the road. But a disagreement over which political party the church would endorse reportedly caused a schism, sending Chester and his followers to establish a new church. In fact, the black church, as it arose in the South following the war, um, were multiplicitous institutions. They not only attended to religious needs, but established schools uh, to educate, um, were social agencies, housed fraternal and social orders, uh, and were political foundations. In fact, it's no accident that you find that within the black community, black leadership characteristically has a church background. Father God of mercy, what did thine only son endure before we drew our breath? Mm -hmm. What pain and labor to secure our souls from endless death? Mm -hmm. We come, Father God, with bad heads and in deep humility. Mm -hmm. Come in thanksgiving, Father, thanking you for this a new day. Mm -hmm. thank you. We thank you, Father, for attending us this morning that we might rise up in time and not into eternity. Yeah. Yes, we thank you, Father, for being enclosed in our right mind, the mind to come out to the house of prayer, mm -hmm. where we can make and co-mingle our voices together, lifting up our voices unto song, yes, and song to thy most holy and everlasting name. One of the because most Father, important church holidays in Freetown was Revival, traditionally Divine held the second Sunday of August. It is still an important holiday today for the descendants of Freetown. As its name implies, it is a time to revive oneself, a chance for those who have gone away to come home and renew old ties. It's a perfect time for keeping the memory of Freetown alive and perhaps passing it on to another generation. I guess it grew out of um, people going away when they came back on their vacation in the summer. And, uh, Everyone look forward to meeting people. But now Freetown is in ruins. This and the chimney are the only structures left. All else that remains are honeysuckle choked foundations, a remembered house site nestled in the cedars. So why did such an obviously successful little community just fade away? There are several opinions. The nearest I could get at why Freetown is out of town today, the younger people left and moved away. And the older people, they died off. And the younger people never came back. They all died out. Uh, all the people, the colored people, in Freetown, stayed down until they got the older people all died out. The young people were living to the city of Washington, New York. Like that. But it got a better job and more money. One of the reasons that a community might break up might have to do with the strong leadership, um, either dying or moving away and community falls apart as a result of that. And so once that generation dies out, and once the next generation goes by the board, and opportunities begin to avail themselves more readily to future generations, then the ultimate purpose of that community sort of fizzles out. The next, the second generation needed more money. And the second generation also needed to expand. That was the reason. And the other reason that young people don't stay put. And before they know it, they are married and have children and can't. And if you read Thomas Wolfe, you can't go home again. <laughs> when I come to the end of the road, I will rest that the rain of day and oh the joy that will reach me when I come to the end of the way.
This program is supported by the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities and Public Policy and is presented as a public service. The principal aim of the program is to discuss in an objective and nonpartisan context issues of concern and interest to citizens of the Commonwealth of Virginia. The views and opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the Orange County Historical Society or the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. If I hold to his hand and I live by his command, I go.